Yep, yeah, that's great. Good morning, everybody. Come on here. Come on. Um, we're very happy, both of us, uh, to give a special award to our friend and colleague, Frank Putnam. Frank, as many of you know, um, is ill and doesn't plan on recovering. And I remember the first time, I don't know if any of you had this experience, but I don't know when it was. I remember the room we were in. We were in an auditorium with some conference, probably in Boston, in the early 90s. And Frank presented his data. He was at NIMH at the time. And he presented data on the first longitudinal study of sexually abused girls. And I had never wanted to stand up and cheer before at a, a presentation of a science, scientific, uh, results of a scientific experiment. But that's what we all wanted to do because the people in the room were people who were treating adults who had very complex problems and we knew they were related to their um, past experience of sexual abuse and all kinds of child abuse, but we didn't have any underpinning, substantial knowledge other than our own experiential knowledge. And here was Frank uh, showing this amazing uh, data that he had. And later, when I became the president of the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies, he was willing to be my vice president. And not unlike the US government, the vice president is a pretty thankless task. You do a lot of work, and you go to all the meetings, and you're on all the phone calls, but that's all that ever happens. Um, and he was wonderfully supportive of me and my work and um, what I needed to do. Um, I think his contribution to our field is impossible to calculate. And many of you may not even be that familiar with Frank because he's a very low-key, humble guy who um, is much more likely to promote and support the people who have are underneath him rather than claim any fame for himself. But the field of developmental traumatology would not probably have happened for a long time without Frank. Um, at the time when he was doing that research on sexually abused girls, that was not a popular research topic. It took a lot of courage and honor uh, to even pursue that topic and pursue that grant at NIMH. Um, and I think Frank suffered a, not, a lot for that stance that he took on saying this was important work to do. And he followed that up with a lot of work on um, dissociation and multiple personality disorder at a time when you could just get laughed out of a room as a psychiatrist if you talked about multiple personality disorder, woohoo! And uh, we now know there was nothing uh, goofy about it, that lots of people with severe trauma suffer from those kind of disorder, dissociative disorders. And he wrote a book about, really the first book about multiple personality in adults, and then he wrote another one um, for children and adolescents. So for me, um, I think Frank represents really and always has what a true scientist is. Um, somebody who consistently and with enormous integrity challenges the existing status quo uh, and fearlessly faces facts that no one else want to see while using the scientific method to really break through barriers that have enormous implications for public health in the interest of human uh, improvement. I think he is a, he has, since leaving uh, NIMH, he's had many other positions, um, but always as a public health professional, a psychiatrist, a teacher, an administrator, a writer, and a great humanitarian. And I'm very, I'm sad to see that he's going to leave the planet, but he leaves us with an enormously wonderful legacy. And Frank, we just want to say thanks. <clears throat> I 
I second everything that Sandra just said. Um, Frank, in my view, is really the father of developmental traumatology. And uh, like Rob Anda at CDC and his struggles to get the ACE study initiated, keep it going, keep it funded, get it through the IRB, all those travails, Frank has faced that kind of opposition that you talked about in the entire course. I first met Frank in 1980 at a meeting of the American Psychiatric Association. We're both psychiatrists. Uh, he went on and trained in child psychiatry after that time because he felt it was important to this research and the studies that he wanted to do. <clears throat> but over the years, we've traveled many of the same roads. We've spent a lot of time together. We've sent, spent a lot of fun times together because one of the organizations that we belong to, the Helfer Society, plans in a half day of adventures at every meeting. So hiking, canoeing, kayaking, whitewater rafting, you know, all those great times. And, th and those have been really been precious, you know, in terms of getting to know a person, you know, through all kinds of uh, experiences. Um, when I gave him the Distinguished Scholar Award at the ABA meeting a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago in Minneapolis, I mentioned that, you know, he also reflects the intergenerational transmission of intelligence and wisdom and humility. Um, one thing that he regrets he ever told me, because I've told others, <laughs> uh, is that when I was trying to persuade him to come to Cincinnati after his time at the NIMH, um, he shared with me that his father uh, had been a scientist. Frank Putnam Sr. was in some ways the father or certainly one of the fathers of cell biology. And he was a traumatologist in that, I just thought of this this morning, but he chaired the nuclear casualty commission for Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, I mean, that's about as extreme a trauma as you can conceptualize. Uh, so Frank comes from a, a tradition and a family of science, and he brought the highest level of science to this field. He also bought, brought a humanism and a caring. And I saw that probably most directly in his concern for the young woman who was originally in our, my publication known as Jane Doe. Some of you may recall that series of publications and the fact that Elizabeth Loftus and others broke her case, her privacy, and published in an effort to attack the whole idea that maybe somebody could lose the ability to recall a trauma and then re remember it later. Um, but he was very concerned about, and her name is Nicole, and she's graduating in a couple of weeks with a PhD in clinical psychology. And Frank was always concerned about her as a person and how she was doing. And <clears throat> agreed to write, again, and there's a special issue of trauma, violence, and abuse that he has an article about his concerns about the ethics issues and how to allow for ethical review of case reports. So as to prevent the kind of violation of privacy and things that occurred in that case. So I, you know, I'm, I feel that Frank has been both an inspiration, a friend, um, a role model, and to this field, he has given a very important legacy. Um, and I want, he wrote an email to Martha expressing his uh, apologies for not being able to be here. And I'm going and we have his permission to share this. Uh, so I'm going to read that. And then we're going to look at just a brief comment, and then I'm going to be done before my time is over. Um, dear Martha, I'm terribly sorry about ruining the surprise. Not that I can do anything about changing my New York City trip. I made a commitment in a legal case more than two years ago and now it is being called in. I spoke with Dave Corwin last night who also tipped me off to the surprise. I'm very touched and moved that so many people want to reach out to me and let me know that I have been important to them 
or made a difference in some way. I am humbled by that. I am very sorry that I can't come to Philly. It was in my plans until my old promise was called in, which I must honor. Everyone should understand that I am at peace with my situation. My wish is to spend as much time with my wife and two sons who live in Tucson and Boston as possible and to finish a number, seven, of work projects, including two books that reflect my current thinking and lifetime experiences. I am limiting my travel to personal and project-specific short trips as traveling is becoming increasingly exhausting and painful. I hope to keep contributing as long as possible, including a paper we call the son slash daughter of the synergy paper I sent you, which will further extend the enormous implications of the ACEs. But I'm not going to any medical extremes and will enter hospice when the time comes. Again, please convey my extreme regrets to everyone that I am able to, that I am not able to attend the Philly celebration. But as I said in Philly last week, it isn't about you or me, it's about the children. So instead of me, I urge you to use time to celebrate everyone's work that contributes to discussing or to decreasing ACEs. Best regards, Frank. Uh -huh. Wow. Um, Frank has given us, with the, his colleague Penelope Trickett and now Jenny Knoll, in their longitudinal cross-sectional cross cohort design, which multiplies the power. Don't ask me what all that means. Um, <laughs> it was impressive to me when he first explained what it was to me, and I can't say I remember, but it does supposedly multiply the power of a relatively small number of subjects. Um, but uh, he's given us the uh, connect the dots from childhood, you know, with a hundred and some data sets, including many biological data sets, um, that takes this retrospective observation from the ACEs, now replicated multiple times and in different ways and different samples, different methodologies. But he, along with the other biological research, shows us how it connects from childhood to adulthood um, on various dimensions. And it's now approved and funded for a couple of more future samplings of that cohort of sexually abused girls and the comparison subjects, which creates the power of the study. So I'd, I'd like to just play the very brief video that this is taken from Frank's discussion after he heard Vince and Rob present at our two at the Academy on Violence and Abuses 2011 meeting, um, and we're this is on the the web now uh, on the internet. His 2011 it's 22 minutes long. You can view it. Um, we can make it possible. We'll have to discuss and think about some of the implications, but. It's, it's where you can get to it and show it to others. It's very profound. It includes, can we play it? Are you ready to go back there? Okay, let's just play it. I've been stalling for time. ACEs changed the landscape. It changed the landscape because of the pervasiveness of the ACEs, the huge number of public health problems, expensive public health problems, depression, substance abuse, sexually transmitted diseases, cancer, heart disease, chronic all right, so you can see that by visiting the AVA website and click on the little V in the lower part of the, the home page. That's Vimeo. That shows you all the videos in the public domain. His entire 2011 plenary is there. We're also going to put his 2013 plenary address that presents the study on the sexually abused girls. So you could go see him present it in his own words. At the, at the current state of evolution of that study. Um, and on that 
same site with the Vimeo, there are, are a few policy edits and educational edits in the public domain that you, about the ACE study that you can download and use in your efforts to educate others and to educate students about the ACEs. So Frank has given us a great legacy. I'm very happy and I want to thank Martha uh, Davis and the organizers for giving us the opportunity to uh, say these few words about Frank this morning. Thank you.